once again. Hello again, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, some of the work that I've been doing in policy work um, around the country has led to some really cool tools of engagement. You know, to sort of break into that black box of what does patient engagement look like. So I'm excited to share it with you. Um, and all of this stuff is really just about human beings talking to each other. When you get down to the heart of it, that's what patient engagement is. Um, I think I don't have a mic, so I'm going to stay here. Is this better? There we go. All right, so let's see if this is working. Mm -hmm. There. So here are the things we're going to talk about today, the patient preferences passport, patient checklists, and the roadmap to patient and family engagement. These are three free resources that are great uh, foundations for um, you know, introducing into a care setting, into a physician practice, into virtually anywhere where it's patient facing. Um, first is the patient uh, preferences passport. And this is just a, such a cool and simple idea. And what happened was the National Quality Forum, which is this um, quasi-governmental uh, organization, they have a whole bunch of stakeholders around the table, that, you know, far, but they have pharmaceutical groups and, and major medical organizations, and, um, but a lot of quality improvement people. And they invited lots of patients to be part of the National Quality Forum Patient and Family Engagement Action Team, and that's a big mouthful. But what was that? Um, 17 people. Um, well, first I'll tell you the three tools we're going to use. The uh, Patient Family Engagement Action Team Passport, the Roadmap to Patient and Family Engagement in Healthcare, and we'll go back to the passport first. So the passport, the notion is that as we go into a healthcare setting, and we um, come across um, different care providers, and we may have one doctor, like especially if you have multiple, like they call it comorbidities, different health care challenges. So you'll go to, um, let's say, the oncologist for one thing, and then you go to the vascular doctor for another thing. These are some of the physicians that my mother has. And um, what you find is that they don't necessarily talk to each other. Even though we have, we're getting better at integrating medical records, what happens is that the second doctor doesn't really know the drugs that the first doctor is prescribing. And so we have all kinds of, you know, people taking more medication than they need. And if you remember from the first session, how long does it take before a doctor typically interrupts a patient and starts to talk? Remember? 18 seconds, good job. So we need to find ways that the doctor, the physician, and the, or the, the, it could be the triage nurse and the ER, whoever it is that gets this patient into care can quickly assess this patient, especially if they have no records on them, can understand what the patient prefers, um, can translate that to the physician that's going to come in, and then the physician can find, use this tool to more quickly um, address the problem and, and, uh, and treat. So what happened here is um, that we, let me just check on to see where my, my slides are here. Okay. Um, I'm going to get deeper into the passport later, but I want to touch on the other tools. Um, the roadmap to patient and family engagement is another thing that we did. And what that is, is the Moore Foundation is a very, um, well-funded public uh, private foundation and they said you know we need to figure out how to engage patients and families everybody talks about it we don't know how to do it so they called together 70 stakeholders from around the country and from all the different phases of care from administrators to physicians and nurses and lots of patients thankfully um, patients and families were represented and they said, we need to create a structure that any organization could look to to map out how to approach patient family engagement. And they came up with this roadmap that is a free tool at patient, I think is it up, up there, patientfamilyengagement.org. And I urge you to write that down or you can go through the slides I think later on. But it's a free tool. It outlines what the challenges are. It outlines what the opportunities are. And it is applicable to virtually any um, patient facing organization. And we, for two days, um, literally had whiteboards with a road going through it. And we were all asked to say, okay, what are the challenges, the roadblocks that we have? We put these stickies up on the board, and then we would sit around, instead of saying, well, we can't fix that because of this roadblock. We were encouraged to think of it as a challenge, that we could do this if. 
And interestingly, by the end of the two-day session, um, there were five different groups, and what everyone came up with is this sort of elephant in the middle of the room, which was um, the special interests. You know, we talked earlier about some of the new ways that we can do things much more cheaply, but those people are not going to give up those dollars easily. So it really takes involvement and, um, and pressure from those of us who get care to talk more about this and, um, and put the pressure back. You know, get our equivalent of free Wi-Fi. You know, if you can get blood drawn for $10 at Walgreens, why do you need to go to a lab and go through that process that we go through right now? Um, so these are some of the strategies of the roadmap. And there are lots of resources. You can join the conversation. Um, they urge you to make commitments if you have uh, something to contribute. They are very res this was put together, as I said, by the, the Moore Foundation, along with the American Institutes for Research. It's a pretty cool thing to review. Now, this is the third thing that we're going to show you today. And this is free tools that we have on, uh, and this happens to be in the Patient Voice Institute website, which is a, it's a nonprofit. We're pending our, uh, nonprofit, our own nonprofit status. But if you went to tools under the website right now, um, you, would you would see these, um, these options. So the Passport is a downloadable free tool where you can fill in all the fields, and I will show you in a minute what those fields are. Um, this is a hard copy version created by Plaintree. Everybody hear of Plaintree? It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, group. It's basically a certification that a hospital has to go through 60 different metrics of patient engagement in order to get certified as a Plaintree hospital. This is a good hospital if you're out of town to look for a plain tree hospital. And you will, you know, the standard of care there is phenomenal. And the president of plain tree, Susan, and Susan Frampton, and I were co-chairs of the National Quality Forum Patient Family Engagement Action Team. So this is the hard copy. Here's the problem. The free tool is great. And those of you who are conversant with technology have no problem getting a download and filling in those text fields. Somebody like my 84-year-old mother. No, she wants a hard copy. She still has my, my cell phone number written on a little business card in her wallet. Anybody know anybody like that? They have little scraps of paper. Much more comfortable with, uh, with hard copy. So the other resource we have um, on the Patient Voice website is checklists. Who has heard of Peter, Pro Peter Pronovost from Johns Hopkins and his surgical checklists? Have you heard of that? OK, some of you have. Um, the idea that Peter Pronovost, who is a, an, a, a surgeon at Hopkins, um, was that if we had checklists for surgeries, as we do for pre-flight takeoff, make sure we go over all these steps very carefully, we will avoid accidents. It works in aviation, and it's been proved to work in the OR, where doctors who do things so routinely um, may not take a certain step that could be critical down the road for that patient's safety. And what Peter Pronovos did with a colleague, with two colleagues actually, is to create patient checklists, checklists for patients around surgeries. So for instance, you're, you're hearing you have to have a cardiac stent, you're going to have a knee replacement. You can go on the website. You can go straight to doctella.com also, which is, um, which is where this resides. And you can ask all the questions or you, you have them right in front of you, what questions should you be asking? Now, a physician practice, rather than coming up with his or her own list of questions for a procedure they do all the time, says, you know what? Go to this link. Look at the questions. And here are my answers. After your surgery, here's what you can expect. I find that with my patients, I do this about question four. It's a way to sort of streamline the whole process in a way that makes the information accessible to the patient and takes less time for the physician so that, that, that time can be better spent. These are the people that were involved in the patient passport. And I apologize if I'm jumping around a bit, but certainly we can have questions when we're done. Um, as you can see, there was a real desire to represent the whole spectrum of people that would be involved in patient care. And the first thing we did was literally look at, and the challenge for us was to create a very easy to use tool, something really simple, not some new sophisticated piece of uh, technical equipment. But when you think about what a passport does for you when you go through the, the airport or into a new country, it has all your essential information at your fingertips. 
and this was the plan for this passport. It's actually already done. Um, the uh, Mattel Children's Hospital in Los Angeles has a pediatric passport that parents asked for because their medically fragile child might be sitting in a busy ER with a, a compromised immune system and have to sit there with sick people and, and because they didn't look sick, they were not being triaged appropriately. So the passport was a way for them to process these kids being cognizant of the underlying medical issues that are not apparent. So that was very successful there. And then uh, over in the UK, they have two or three versions of the passport, mostly for special needs populations where they can't speak necessarily as well for themselves. So we took, we had conference calls with all these people. We asked them what they learned. We asked them what was working and what was still a challenge. And then we got this group together and we cobbled, we literally tore off pages of certain passports and put them up on a sticky wall and cobbled together our own version of the passport. And the idea is that the passport would really help with shared decision making. It, it gives the patient, like this is mine, this is my statement of my preferences, so that it allows for that shared decision making and that collaboration to happen from the very first moment that they begin in the care process. And as I said, it was modeled on existing tools used by the Mattel Children's Hospital. And then we were promoting, you know, we thought of this as the perfect tool to promote patient and family engagement and written in the patient's voice. If you looked at this, and I'll pass this around, I'd love to give you all a free copy of this. The fact is that this is one of the barriers to getting one of these in everybody's hands. This thing costs $3 for Plain Tree to create, which is ridiculous. Um, it's because they don't have, you know, if you do great volumes, if CVS or Walgreens decided, yeah, we want to offer these free in our pharmacies, you know, go ahead and put coupons in it. You know, this would be fantastic to have available in every single pharmacy. So that's my hope is one of you has a cousin or a relative that works there that wants to do this for patients. So hospitals are piloting this passport. And as I said, you can go straight to doctella.com to get a free mobile app. So what does it look like? This is some of what we try, we, we would wanted to integrate into it and, and we distilled from all these things what we would uh, put together. So this person has medical issues not immediately apparent, assess immediately. We decided that that was up to the physician to put a sticker on that if that was important. Huh. Oh, there's a second presentation here. I apologize. Just give me a second. Does anybody have a question while I'm pulling up the second slideshow? Let's see. And there comes Rhonda. Rhonda, do you know where the second show is? <laughs> yeah. Why don't I pass this around and you'll begin to see what I'm talking about.
practice this? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, instead of this? Yeah. Okay. So we begin with, you know, hello, my name is. Um, interestingly enough, when you look at a chart, they can vary. You know, some physicians go to diff different facilities, charts look different. Um, this is a way for them to see this right off the bat. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Say again. The down arrow? Yeah. No, just click it where? <laughs> sorry. I'm a Mac person. I apologize. I just tap it. Okay. And then how do I scroll it? All right, thank you. So the first page um, is really just to give people background on when they first get the passport so they know how to fill it in. And the goals are to have a conversation, to communicate, um, to have less questions that have to be asked multiple times, and to prepare mentally and emotionally for the hospital visit. And the goals for the provider are to see the patient as a human being with unique preferences, so they'll be treated with dignity and kindness, to have more accurate real-time information about their health, lifestyle, goals, and needs, and to talk to the patient and listen rather than having no time to ask questions and not getting the right information. And then, of course, to reduce medical errors, which is a very important goal. And the first person, we took this clue from, um, oops. We took this clue from one of the passports that we saw, which red means stop. Red is triage. This is the first place the patient goes. So this is what has to be known at the very moment the patient appears for care. The diagnoses that the person has. I have um, COPD. I have you know, uh, a cancer diagnosis. I have high blood pressure. My current medication list is inside this pocket. So it's right there, right at hand. And then, of course, the, the vitals over there on the right, whether you have um, you know, eyeglasses, hearing aids, any of these devices that are important. And if you have a religious preference and how that might impact your care. You know, some people um, choose not to get blood transfusions, this sort of thing. And then the person who needs to be contacted, um, allergies and whether I have a disability or impairment. And then the next page you'll see, and we li really literally decided we had to keep this very short to be, you know, they're pages for notes, but the bulk of it is these, these key pages are in front, is my healthcare team. Who's my primary care physician? Who are my specialists? What is the condition they're treating me for? And then my health history and goals, my previous hospitalizations, the dates and times and the events. And then if you need additional space, again, we have pockets for you to continue um, the story that you need to tell. The last question there really was one that we just all agreed was so important. You know, we, we have a vision of what each patient should be doing and achieving when they leave the hospital. That they, you know, what is our definition of what good health is for them? I can tell you that for my 84-year-old mother, playing bridge and driving her car are the two most important things to her. So Maureen Bosignano of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement talks about, you know, the patient's goal, think about putting it even at the bedside that this patient doesn't really expect necessarily to, to have as much of, a, of a, a physical lifestyle she had before. She wanted to be able to mow her lawn again. And so looking at the patient for their own desires and expectations of their outcomes is part of a good care plan. And when we know what their goals are, we can plan together. We can share in that decision making. And then the nurses. 
The wonderful nurses get a hold of the patient, and what do they need to know? Well, if that patient has been in here a while, these are the things that might be helpful. If there is time in that crazy busy day for, them, for the nurse to actually spend some time with this patient. And this is a deeper level of need and preference that the patient who, the longer a patient is in, the more important these things can be. The right side of this page speaks to how comfortable the patient is asking questions. So it might give you a little bit of a sense of, does this patient need my, and I wouldn't say intervention, but maybe I should inquire if a family member can come by because they're not asking the kinds of questions that they should be asking. Do they have support from friends and family? You know, this is, I think, a, a critical problem with, you know, we talk about how the need, there's a need for a patient or uh, a family member or an advocate to be by the patient and to be uh, present at discharge. And some hospitals are talking about requiring that a patient, that a, a hospital inform a family member to take responsibility for this patient, which is not really, uh, th there are all kinds of legalities with that. But the point is this, that a lot of families are fractured. A lot of people don't have that person to stay by the bedside. They may not have this support at home. And as we move to more of the accountable care organization model, you know, where we have resources in the, uh, or we have the patient-centered medical home where we're treating patients more holistically, we have to answer the question, who's going to step into that role for that patient that doesn't have anybody? If you spend any time in a hospital with a person who's been in for a long time and you walk past the same rooms, as I did in neurology and some of you might have for family members, and you look in the door and you see people that don't, don't have anybody, I think that's sort of one of the stumbling blocks we're going to have as we sort of shift care into the home environment. Because even if the family member says, yeah, I'll do it, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure she takes her medicine and, and this and that, it's, it often doesn't happen. So we have to figure out ways to address that. And I think a tool like this will help to help this information emerge in a realistic way. Because if you're asking the question and you can make a note on it, now we're starting to gather experiences that are similar and you can get a handle on the numbers of people for whom this is a problem. Here's another page for nurses. They get two. And this is a, um, a really, I think, important opportunity for us to ask the questions about end of life. That conversation is so hard, and as you know, there are many initiatives underway um, to, to help generate that conversation home. It's called the Conversation Project. There is a wonderful website called Engage with Grace, and it's just one slide with five questions on it that you can print off and ask your loved one to fill in. It's not notarized, and it's not signed by a lawyer, but it's at least a way to generate the conversation. So if this happens to be distributed in broad ways, and it's sort of a default thing that is asked, it doesn't become that huge hurdle for families. Because it's really one of the most painful things to do at, the, you know, at a time when there's a medical crisis for the family members to have to figure out what would mom have wanted. So this is a great uh, opportunity for us to make that a standardized thing that we do. And then, of course, notes. Most of the pages you'll find of the passport are opportunities to add information, notes, and printouts. So that is the passport. Um, all of these things are, I think, represent some of the work, and I didn't mean to imply earlier that there isn't a lot of work being done on patient family engagement by some very well-meaning people. We have the partners in the provider world and in, uh, in the regulated, regulator world um, that really want to move the dial on this stuff. But as I said before, you know, we, we're, we're ascribing all the resources and, um, and all the responsibility for patient and family engagement on a policy level to providers. And they should not have to do all the heavy lifting. And I think the challenge is, for organizations like the Patient Voice Institute and other consumer-oriented groups and patient advocate groups is to rally our memberships and our constituents and get them, you know, by ways that include the ways that Lee was talking about earlier with social media and with, with 
interesting and intriguing ways of capturing the public imagination to become a more responsive partner, to, to be good tango dance partners. And that is how we will have a more functional, holistic healthcare system. So does anybody have any questions? It's pretty much an outline of those tools. I know not everybody has seen the passport yet. Yep. or even as a model, uh, you know, the, I don't know besides Plaintree who's actually printed them. And this is a, a, this is a 2.0 project for the, the Patient Family Engagement Action Team of the National Quality Forum. There's a major um, hospital system that's looking to deploy this on a big level. For right now, you know, the only option would be to ask Plaintree if they have another copy. I'm sorry to say. And this is a little, make, makes me a little crazy, you know, when you think about it. $500 for one procedure, and we can't get somebody to donate $500 to give passports out in, in, the, in the practice. Because there probably isn't going to be the kind of easily accessed data that we're used to having in the system. But you know intuitively, don't you? That when my, my mom, um, a few months ago, I wrote a blog post, it's on the Patient Voice Institute website, and it's called Why You Need a Passport in the Emergency Room. And she was rushed to the hospital, felt terrible, heart palpitations, horrible leg pain. She's a cancer patient. She had severe blood clots in both legs. But even though they had integrated medical records for all of the hospitals and, and providers that she had been to, they asked the same questions over and over. I understand that asking again can be a way of catching mistakes. But in terms of when was your procedure, um, how long were you hospitalized? You know, some of these are facts. They're not going to change. And if you had them written down in one go-to place, it saves time for the care team. It saves time for the, and frustration for the patient. And it's just a much more effect, efficient way to do it. I'm sorry I can't answer more positively. The, there was Perry Cohen, for instance, he's from the, um, the Parkinson's Institute. I mean, he's, he's got severe Parkinson's disease, but he, he, and he was actually a really good gut check for us and a lot of the stuff that we were talking about. He's very severely challenged physically. And it was important that we made sure this tool represented that, a population that really couldn't help itself. We had Kim Lee uh, Blanton. I don't know if I can go back and show you. I don't think I have it up here anymore, but um, she works for the Vidant Healthcare System, and she had family members um, and herself in the Vidant System for several illnesses. So she now is the voice of the patient in a lot of different areas of the hospital system. She she heads the patient advisory council there, and she is uh, she she tells it like it is, you know. Um, and then there, although I'm not technically a patient, I have been a care provider and very active in caring for patients for eight years. Um, those are the ones that come to mind off the top of my head. Um, Libby Hoy, who runs Patient and Family Centered uh, PFCC, which is, I forget, but she, she has three sons that have mitochondrial disease, um, one of whom was not supposed to make it. She's been a very robust advocate for her, her children her whole life. and because, Though she does run an organization, her organization assists hospitals in creating PFACs, Patient Family Advisory Councils. So, yeah, I mean, we, we were almost half of the 17 people. Um, and we would have had more than we did, except that there were not the applicants, which is part of the problem that I talked about before. You know, patients have a life they, you know, patients typically in, in a conference setting might be the only ones that had to take vacation days to go to the conference, even to speak. They have jobs, they have families, and although in a conference, 
you know, organizations send their representatives there. Um, the cost of, going, of participating is not underwritten by an organization. I was a volunteer for this. So, and so is everybody else. So that's a challenge. We have to find, if, if we're to add that value, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we expect patients to do this as volunteers and everybody else is compensated? It's just a challenge. Anybody else? Mm -hmm.
thank you. Um, so what sort of discussions have, have gone on around, first of all, does the patient own this? Like, do the clinicians write in this at all, or is it strictly for the patient? The, um, can you hear me okay talking here? Okay. Um, the idea is that the patient would fill it out with some assistance from, if not the primary care physician, but that you have to roll, this was part of what the whole discussion was, that this has to be rolled out within a facility. You can't just spring it on somebody. You have to be passport ready. And that means that maybe if a physician practice wanted to try it, they would designate somebody that, you know what, I, need, I want you to spend two minutes at the end with every patient. I mean, you could, you know, conceivably it doesn't have to be a, a high-level employee and help them with the fields that, they're, that they need help with so that that service would be offered before you leave. But, you know, whether the physician would write in it, I mean, a lot of this stuff would just be two human beings figuring it out. Um, what's neat about a patient writing it down is that, you know, when a patient when they did an experiment where patients were asked to write down their own appointment time rather than have a card handed to them, that the no-shows were reduced by 25%. The idea that you write something in your own hand, it's like when you're a third grader in school and you take notes, is that it impresses the truth, you know, the, the facts upon you. So then the, the follow-up to that would be has, or what kind of discussion has been around what is clinically relevant that goes into this passport and then you know does the clinician have the ability to say let's take this out of your passport it's not relevant to me whereas it might be for someone with parkinson's how have you know what's been discussed around that these are some of the great questions that i think are being uh, discussed in pilots where they will come up in the in in real life and these are some of the learnings that will be shared you know plain tree for instance is doing this now with their breast cancer unit and um I don't know that it will ever be perfect. And in an ideal world, um, there are uh, extra passports available. They'll cost, you know, 10 cents a piece instead of $3. So when it gets too many cross-outs and additions, you can start over. Um, but, I, you know, at what threshold of success is it not a good idea? You know, so the, the, the notion of patients taking some degree of charge over that conversation is what this is. I noticed that um, in yes, yeah, sorry. I noticed in the passport that there was a focus on ADLs, um, like the bathing, the toileting, and on, on, what? on bathing and toileting yeah. and eating. Sorry, I have a quiet voice. Um, and I was just wondering if there was um, if it focused at all on any of the eye ADLs. Focused on the instrumental activities of daily living at all? Some instrumental activities? I'm, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Instrumental activities of daily living? Does it yeah. focus on that at all or just the... What's important is for the care team to know um, by default that the patient needs help with certain things. And that question actually came out um, when we looked at the UK passports that dealt with a special needs population. But my mother needs help with bathing. You know, she, some patients do. It's just a way to sort of assess that and understand it at the outset so that even before you go and do the debrief with the patient, you can discuss with the staff, you know, who can do that and when. And, and those questions don't get asked too late or not asked at all or asked six times. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Aging ears. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, another question over here. Oh, just wait, he's bringing you a microphone. And this may already be conceptualized, but it'd really be cool if uh, the provider, health provider, could maybe at the end of um, a visit, um, it would answer the question, do you want to update the patient passport? You know, I'm gonna come down there because I'm, I'm sorry. Here, let me talk a bit better. It would be really be cool if the provider would have the option, do you need to update the patient's passport? Uh, right. And it would come up, and then it would ask, where does that information go? Mm. Are you cleaning up a problem, or, a, you know, or are you adding a new medication or new information, right. or do you need to delete something? 
but it would give you the option where to place it. And then it would automatically go to the app. The, cust the patient would be asked to update right. their passport. It'd really be cool. If that's a great, that's a great, that great point. I'll bring that back to the committee. And then they can print it out to give them a hard copy. Right. There's a whole suite of tools as well that were developed for the provider side for them to implement, and some of them are resources to send a patient to. For instance, if they want a document about a DNR, if they want, you know, um, the surgical checklist, or all these things are free resources that are part of, um, if you went on the National Quality Forum's website, I believe all the downloads are there. But anybody that can't find what they need about this, feel free to reach out to me on email um, and, and we'll find the answers for you. But that's an, that's an excellent suggestion. What you're talking about is systemizing um, all these steps, anticipating what are the things that are going to be the biggest hurdle, and creating an elegant solution that makes sense for everybody. We appreciate that. Yep, anybody else? No? I think we have a little time to go and have a cup of coffee, if you'd like. Um, but I thank you very much for attending, and um, I hope that you find these tools useful. As I said, reach out to me if I can be of any more help. Thank you. The time before lunch, but sometimes they open early. You know, so you can check back. The room is just right behind us. It's called Carter Hall A, and you access it just first door on your left. If you're a student, you have your ticket, and if you don't, stop at the desk and get one, and have fun. <laughs>